What I do is inconsequential. Why I do what I do is I get to shorten people's journeys every day. What I love about our hospitality industry is that it's our mission to make people feel cared for while on their journeys. Together, we'll explore what hospitality means in the built environment, in business, and in our daily lives. I'm Dan Ryan, and this is Defining Hospitality. Today's guest is a talented designer who's on the cutting edge of design. She has over 25 years of experience and is an important fixture in our hospitality community. She served as an adjunct professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. She is a senior director of design and project management at Marriott International. Ladies and gentlemen, Linda Lasarica. Welcome, Linda. Hi, thank you. It's so good to have you here. Um, I want to give everyone a little bit of color on when we first met, because I remember it vividly. And it was when the West, uh, when the meatpacking district, it was, I don't even know if it was called the meatpacking. It was just like below 14th Street on the West Side. And there were, it was always meatpacking. I feel like it was just, it was just a place where there was meatpacking, a lot of, a lot, a lot of butchers. <laughs> yeah. Meatpacking and, and other things that happened at night, late at night. <clears throat> but uh, it was when people actually still worked there and designed there and, um, you could get like really good rents and it was like a really creative, vibrant community. Um, and it, it's changed so much. Now it's like a crazy outdoor shopping mall. And I remember walking in, you were working at McCartan design with, with mm-hmm. Palm, right? Mm-hmm. And I just, I remember walking up the stair. I remember being in a suit cause I was like 20 something. And I felt like I had to wear a suit to feel like I knew what I was talking about. And, uh, <laughs> it was so hot. And I just remember just dripping sweat coming in to meet you and i'm sorry for that first impression but but here we are 20 years later i don't remember that honestly i remember meeting you i don't remember the sweat don't worry oh, oh good so now i now i have something to talk about with my therapist um but it's it's so good to have you here and uh also just knowing you for so long and seeing your career journey and arc and where you are now and all the important things you're doing at marriott from a brand perspective which i know we'll talk about um, in a little bit. And it's, it's, it's really exciting um, on a lot of different levels. But before we get into that, you know, I got to ask you the big question of, you know, what does hospitality mean to you? Yeah, the big question. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, first off, I want to say congratulations on your two year anniversary for Thank this you. podcast. I just saw Thank, that. Thank um, you. Yeah, two years. Wow. It's amazing. It's, yeah, yeah. Time flies. So like we've known each other for a million years. Um, yeah, so hospitality to me, uh, it, it really is the desire to, uh, to give comfort and joy. It's, uh, it's the celebration of, of a shared human experience um, and wanting to connect um, you know, through that humanity. Uh, that to me is hospitality. Um, it's, it's gracious and it's giving. And um, I know that's what a lot of people have said on this podcast of yours, but um, it's, I, I, I always think back to uh, like the Peanuts, Charlie Brown and the Peanuts characters mm-hmm. uh, and this sort of idea of, of finding happiness or defining happiness. And that is also sort of, I think, parallel with hospitality. Um, and that happiness is, is defined differently by different people. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think there's a universal um, definition that uh, it's, it's finding joy and pleasure in the small things in life, finding meaning and significance in the smaller things. Um, I'm really, thank you. And I'm really happy you brought up the peanuts because um, as a former adjunct professor at, NJIT. Mm -hmm. And I guess, and this actually could be a really great departure into um, the evolution of your understanding of of hospitality or the further clarification of it. But like, how as a professor with all those kids in front of you, would you keep them captivated and not sound like one of the teachers on the (laughs) peanuts? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I did. I was, you know, I'm not in, I wasn't in their heads, but I probably did sound like that sometimes. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, it's, you know, well, I taught I taught a studio class, so it was definitely hands on. It was mm-hmm. it was a lot more um, uh, active participation on the part of the students. So it wasn't just me lecturing. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, and um, and 
it was uh it was really trying to have the students um get into the minds of their um fictitious or prospective clients like who are they designing for uh, mm -hmm. i taught residential design and i actually was able to in the final project of the semester use a um, small boutique hotel project as the final project for my students um so they had to uh you know, really come up with a concept statement, a thesis for their project and and write that out in paragraph form. And every design decision that they made had to tie back to that to that thesis. Mm -hmm. um, so in a sense, that was that was sort of, you know, trying to teach them narr narrative design. So I, I brought this up in these conversations before, and I'm still very mystified by this fact. But I took all fine art, like a lot of fine arts classes in high school. Um, painting, drawing, sculpting. I would mm -hmm. like do pottery and all this stuff. And then one summer when I was in high school, I went to Cornell and I did like this architectural discovery program. And I, I learned about architectural design, but take the word architectural out of it and just design. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying, coming up with a thesis, writing it out in paragraph and really thinking about it. And it, it, it's, um, it's taking very nebulous ideas creating a thesis and then in a linear way, writing about it. And in a, in a way, what it taught me was that actually writing, and I love writing, um, and I'm writing a lot of stuff all the time, but um, writing is really a way of design. It's a, it's a, it, you have to design what you're writing. Yes. And it, it take these, all these different ideas and because you can only put one word in front of the other. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a really important way of clarifying um, priorities and what you're trying to convey. And I know that there's oftentimes in, in design and this, people say it's overused, but I, I can't think of a different way to talk about, but this idea of storytelling or narrative, mm -hmm. but that's really in essence what it is. And I think, and that's what design is. It's like, what are you trying to convey and how do you get a halo effect from that to keep people coming back or, or to imprint a really positive memory on them? Like, what are your thoughts on that? I love talking to professors. <laughs> uh well i mean at my at my core i was so i was an english literature major right so english lit is is kind of in my blood and i was a studio art minor in college so that that intersection of um of storytelling and design has always been at my you know at my core and my passion uh so from you know, we, we talk about editing, right? Editing our designs, um, making sure that the design decisions we make are significant for that particular project. Um, and that also ties back to the idea of narrative or storytelling, right? You want to edit your, edit your story, edit your words so that you have a really clear um, message that you're trying to to get across. And that message also wants to have an emotional connection to who you're speaking with, right? Um, otherwise, why why write the story? Why share your thoughts? Um, so when we, um, you know, it, it's interesting at, at Marriott, uh, we have many, many, many brands. And uh, the ones that I work on are specifically the full service lifestyle um, brands. Uh, we call them premium distinctive uh, segment of brands. Um, and so because it's lifestyle, uh, and it's full service, there's this really sort of aspirational, um, design that has to go hand in hand with the, with the brand itself. So, um, you know, so that's storytelling is critical. Before you go into that, I know cause yeah. there's so many brands, but I'm also yeah. amazed and I, I want to keep going with this train of thought, but yeah. just to let the listeners know there's 30 something brands, correct? And, and growing, yes. And growing, right. But when you, I was actually really amazed how when Marriott acquired Starwood and got all those brands, I was like, how are they going to differentiate this and all this? And I remember so much work went into creating that grid of like, okay, premium, distinctive, luxury. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what they all are. But like it, in a way, it makes sense to me. Um, and specifically just to let, I, what I wanted to let everyone know is this on this uh, premium, distinctive, silo that you're in or, or cross section however you want to talk about a matrix it's westin it's autograph it's le meridian it's renaissance design hotels tribute and 
Gaylord? Gaylord. No. <laughs> no, not Gaylord. Okay. Well, Gay- yeah, Gaylord is it is it is it is considered a premium distinctive, but I think it's in a league of its own. It's such a, a, me- a mega, you know, it's like a mega resort kind of place. Um, so we don't really do this, but yeah, we have we have so we have a handful that are what we call hard brands, mm-hmm. and that is the Westin Le Meridian Renaissance. And uh, and W hotels. Oh, and W. Sorry. Yeah, I mean W pushes into the luxury, but it's lifestyle luxury. Great. Um, we could, I can share a little bit more on that later. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get back to that because there's like cr- pretty. I like the W story from as it relates to my experience with hospitality. Yeah. And and on my career path, and it it's just super exciting, and we'll we'll get there. But I want to go back to this idea of editing, right? So, yeah. so. Sorry for the the sidebar, everyone. But yeah, um, no, okay. I need to contextualize things so we can tell a story. So, uh, so they're coming up with this idea. They're they're writing it. You're an English lit major. Editing is a really important process in this iterative design process. And so, keep going. Yes. So, <laughs> so the you know the one thing that I have always asked my students, and I actually ask of our. Um, our design partners um, is that you have when you do all of this research and you put together your contextual insight um, and you're you're analyzing that context through the lens of the brand that you're you're designing for right um, at the end you need to sort of wrap it all up wrap it up with a bow and and we call it we call it give me the elevator pitch if I was to get in an elevator with you give me two or three sentences that you could define the concept for your project um, because that really helps. It helps our, it helps our owner um, franchisee who's hired the designer, it helps the designer and it helps us from the brand perspective to then have something that we can all you know, lean back on and say, is this design decision that you're proposing supporting your, your thesis in a mm-hmm. sense? And so that's where the editing comes in because there's so many, so many options out there and, and, you know, it's 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 interesting. I work on so many um, projects for our brands that you know you start to see uh, some of those same inspiration images over and over again. It doesn't matter what the brand is necessarily. You you see what the trends are out there, mm. and so you have to ask back to the designer. Well, is that particular gesture um, the right one for this project and for this brand? Because you know, as we know, there, there, we don't, we don't, we don't do the cookie cutter, right? We, we are the bespoke, um, you know, design driven brands. So, um, even though, even though it's an overarching brand umbrella, everyone has to feel, every project has to feel unique to its destination. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, running around and all the, with all these different entrepreneurs of all these different companies, I also find that, um, that's culture, right. And that's values and really, it, to come up to that elevator right. pitch, you have to be really clear in in all of the values and really ultimately the whys. Like, why is this way? Yes. And it, again, it's in why sales. Why is my favorite word? <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah, what's that? You ask why five times on anything, and you'll get to a root cause or a root yeah. a root idea. But it's uh, it's really important, and especially like if you look at the however many brands of all hotels that are out there, and the however many properties. Look, you have independence and you have branded, and there's mm. I think there's positives and negatives to both. Um, but if you look at like the big hotel brands, they bring so much more to the table from a brand, and even to just move away from the idea of hotels because we can get um, I don't know biased in this because it's what it's what we do. Um, just other brands like Nike or or Apple or Google or Tesla, like all these big, crazy brands, there's this halo effect that makes whatever that elevator pitch is so much more than it creates raving fans. It's the real Mm -hmm. value driver is in these brands. And yes, what are your thoughts on that? So that's a really interesting question because, you know, I I listed some of our hard brands um, that we work on, but we also have a category called soft brands. Um, and those are our collection brands, right? Autograph collection, tribute portfolio, luxury collection. Um, these are, in a sense, those those uh, independent, um, you know, brands or one-offs. Um, and and we've we've sort of learned that there's a very different approach 
to creating a you know what we call a narrative for our soft brands than it is for our our hard um, or fixed brands. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, you know we we often start out when we're explaining to designers on on the soft brands that it's you know you can't just go out there and do your contextual insight like you do for a hard brand because for the hard brands we're giving you the toolkit we're giving you the strategy we're presenting it to you and saying this is the lens you need to look through um, just you know go out there and 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 find a, a why. Uh, for our soft brands, though, we sort of start out by saying, listen, if Nike came to you, as a good example, if Nike came to you and said, please design a, um, you know, an exclusive uh, high-end stylish shoe for us. We want to get into a, you know, a little bit of a white market there, white, you know, um, space. And you go back, you ideate, you, you come up with, all, you have all these inspiration images and you come back to them and you hand them a, you know, Manolo Blahnik high heeled sandal. Well, you, you, you delivered what they asked for, but you didn't design on brand, right? It's not a Nike version of that. So when, when our designers are faced with a soft brand, um, the owner has actually had to go, uh, hire a, um, a branding agency who does who creates um, who does a market study creates a, a, a brand architecture to fit that white space that that um, you know that area needs where that property is going, and the designer then actually has to create a a design strategy. It's not a narrative at that point. They have to start with a strategy. Mm. Uh, to support that brand and and define how you know define how they will deliver that brand in three dimension in a sense. So they have mm-hmm. to come up with um, you know a brand vision, uh, a brand ethos, and a design strategy that supports the um, the the brand pillars and the brand personality. So it, it has to be a direct connection. Um, and I think a lot of designers don't realize that that. You have to do that step first before you can jump into creating a narrative. It's actually interesting you say that because recently I was at a conference in Denver and we were staying in an independent hotel. And when all these speakers got up, I think some of the owners and other other brands were there. They were saying, I was like, oh, the designer did a great job here. But what I was, as they were talking about it and like doing tours, it was really the branding that everyone was, yeah, they appreciated what the designer had done, but it was really the branding agency got a lot of credit because I think hmm. they have a system and a process and a story to like come up with what the brand is. And then the designer, it makes it easier to execute on that, that story and that thesis. And I, so I, I was a little surprised by that then. I didn't really think about it much, but now what you're saying now on the soft side slash independent, that's really, really important to put so much um, forethought into that and defining it and being having creating these defensible positions like so that you can really execute on what that idea or thing or feeling or place is. Yeah, that that is the most successful property. And I'll say design project is always the one where there is, um, you know, a really clear uh, line, a really clear connection between what the brand is trying to say and what the guest experience is in the physical space. Um, and so again, that comes back to the editing, right? Like what, what, is, what is your perspective on color and materiality and lighting mm-hmm. and like everything that goes into a designer's toolbox, right? That we use on every single project. Why pick this? you know, this crayon out of the box versus this one for this particular project, right? There, there has to be that why. And that's, mm. where, that's where the story comes in. And that's where that, you know, that thesis, that really concise, clear picture uh, is so helpful. So I want to go, uh, okay. So I'm going back to the English lit major, I, I studied literature, mm-hmm. focus on American literature, but I did take a class um on science fiction because I'm just a big geek. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> but but when you you kept saying the word editing, and again, that mm. iterative process is really part of design. And what was interesting, Dune is one of my favorite series of science fiction books. And I think they did a really good job with the movie and the second movie is coming out. But what we studied was, is that it was interesting as we were going from early science fiction to like mid, mid 60s to into the 70s, um, 
Frank Herbert, who wrote Dune, he wrote Dune, the first three on a typewriter, the old-fashioned way, mm. and would rewrite with each page, so I'm told by the professor. But basically, take the page, and you're, he's actually physically rewriting it. The later books got super, like, metaphorical and dreamy, and it was like, because he was tackling some weird things, but it was also very choppy. And what was interesting, it was that the his editing, it was the first time that he started using a word processor, so he could copy and paste, and it became, like, a bit choppier as a as a reader of this, right? Or as an editor, mm -hmm. um, how are you finding, is there any correlation between that choppiness versus seamlessness on the iterative process with technology and design? Are you seeing, mm. are, do, you, do you see anything with that? That's an interesting question and that you're kind of throwing me, throwing that one at me there. Uh, technology is so, it's so interesting how, uh, you know, we've seen even just within our, you know, span of knowing each other in our careers, um, you know, going from, I can remember back in the days of Rockwell Group, going to Barnes and Noble, buying books, like bags and bags of books, photocopying pictures on the copier, deciding like how big, like scaling them 200%, 300%, 75%. So I could cut them out, mount them on foam core and put them on a presentation board. Yeah. And we would spend nights doing this. And have these big boards to tell the story, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, now, you know, what are we doing? We're we're going onto Pinterest and Instagram, and we're collecting images online. Um, you know, how does that process? How has that process affected what designers are seeing and how they are choosing to edit? And the rabbit hole you go down as you, you know spiral into like what does this lead you to what does this lead you to right yeah. um and and you know now we ha now we also are thinking everything in three dimension too so when i was teaching my students uh were doing everything in revit um they didn't even know how to use a scale ruler mm. so uh, i would ask them as like well you're drawing this you know in in 2d in plan you're drawing a, you know, a square that represents a table. What what size is that table? Like, can, or that chair? Can you actually, you know, sit in that? Is that scale? Like, is that the right? Like, does that feel right mm. to you? Like, do you know what you're designing? So it's interesting. But but they could visualize th things in three dimensions so much more easily than I could when I was in school. So interesting. The technology definitely, you know, they're all it's all tools and how you use those tools. Um, to then create, again, the three-dimensional space that is relative to our human experience, like going back to our human, our human experience and our connections, right? Mm. We still sit in a chair. <laughs> We've yes, always we sat in a chair, right? They're not going so, anywhere. And it's, and it's got to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the style, style aside, that's, uh, you know, there are some basics that, will, that won't change just because of... Yeah. how it has to function and how we are. I'm a, yeah, I just I, like that whole idea of the tac tactile interaction with the projects that we're working mm -hmm. on. And I even just see it with my kids, like when they're playing games on their iPads and whatever, it's, uh, I remember when I was young, see, now I can sound like <laughs> the, the old guy. But, like, I would we play with blocks guys. Or, 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 guys. Yeah, or action figures or like, I would actually use my hands and do stuff in it. I don't know, mm -hmm. just, I guess it's just a different experience. I can't like, I'm not judging. Um, okay. That was a little sidetrack, but thank you. But I, I, I really, <laughs> yeah, it's like that chop, the, the choppiness of editing. Um, and now we've got AI, versus... throw that into the, into the mix, you know, and that's yeah. all about editing. That's choosing your, choosing your prompts to create mm -hmm. something new. Right. So that's actually interesting on the, on the AI, on the AI thing and choosing prompts. I'm using that as like a, a muse, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, how are you finding using that or like are you guys exper like how are you experimenting with that um through your design process and iterative process that i, I haven't really gotten into it to be honest um, uh. i'm curious to see you know i'm curious i haven't it hasn't presented itself yet so we'll see which who will be the first designer to to come to, to the table with a with a presentation yeah. that includes I, I, that I, I, I was with someone and they were showing me like a rendering of a room that they used in some mm -hmm. 3D AI mm -hmm. thing. And they were saying, yeah, it took like 30 seconds and it's, 
look, is it perfect? No, but it's like, it's a great first step. It's like, it's like as a right, as a writer, it's like you stare at that blank page and you're like, okay, I have an idea, but like, just give me a, give me a push. That's why I say it's kind of yeah. like a, it's a muse in a way. It's like a prompt. It's like a prompt, yeah. you know, like here's your, here's the, here's the, here's the premise. Now, you know, write something about this. Right. Totally. And it's yeah. funny. Um, I think if AI was around or as easily available as it was two years ago when I started this podcast, one of the main motivations I had for starting the podcast was I was writing all these articles to like present myself as like a, a thought leader or whatever in in our industry. <laughs> and it was like, I wrote like 50 or 60 articles on design and trends and, and I like writing, but I was like, Oh, I'm like, I'm my, my well is running dry and it's annoying. It's like one of the data points in creating this was like, wow, if I just do podcasts and talk to people, I could plagiarize myself. Get lots of ideas. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get, I get lots of ideas. But if AI were there two years ago, I may not have done this. Maybe I would have been like, oh, let me just keep writing this way um, or using this muse to help. So that's actually an interesting idea. It okay. So back, back to you. Um, so <laughs> when I met you in the, in the meatpacking, uh, you were working and designing hospitality projects, but were you always there? And like, how did you, how did you find as a, as a fan of, as a designer and a fan of design and someone who's super passionate about it, how did you find your way into hospitality? Mm, mm, mm. Good question. So uh, I think it really, it comes back to uh, my love of storytelling of literature um, and and art uh, and that combination of interests. Uh, I didn't know that I wanted to study interior design. Um, after college, uh, I started working, um, I, I moved to Washington DC and I started working um, uh, as a freelancer basically in the, in the local theater um, community. And I was doing stage set design and scene painting and you know that kind of support stuff. Uh, what theater? Uh, but all of those, like Woolly Mammoth, all of those, like little, like um, arena stage, those little <gasps> theaters. Yeah, the arena stage is a cool. I went to one there yeah, when I was cool. like thirteen or fourteen because it's like in the round, and that yeah. was really yeah. that was crazy. I can't imagine designing a a play for that. Right, that must be really hard because every, I was a young college grad, so you know I was there painting sets. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting because like there's people all around the stage, mm. so that must have been presented a whole bunch of different challenges. That's cool. Anyway, I'm sorry. Keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and and then I started uh, doing some back in the day uh, faux faux painting. So on the side, I was I started working for a, a a house painter who was doing you know rag finishes and faux faux bois faux marble. And so I was going out there like <laughs> I was. I was doing strie rag finishing and all that stuff. Um, and that's that's where I kind of was like, well, I really love designing physical spaces and working and creating and transforming physical spaces. Um, I, 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 that's where I sort of landed on, you know, what I think I'm going to switch and go to interior design and went back to school, uh, moved back up to New York, um, went to New York School of Interior Design. And, uh, and when I grabbed, when yeah. I'm sorry. When you went yep. to New York School of Design, did you have like super buff shoulders from like yes, like I painting did. interior? Like I remember, I had I painted houses for a Everybody summer. Everybody thought and I was a rower. I was like, oh, yes. no, I'm not a rower. I'm a it's so it's so physical and exhausting. But I was like, yeah. whoa, how about that? Yeah. And I was rowing at the time, so it kind of helped me. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, yes. So uh, yeah. So uh, my one of my first jobs out of then design school was at Rockwell Group. And oh, that is true. That was sort of the culmination of my passion for theater, for storytelling, for, you know, for design, um, totally. for experiential design. It was just, it was, it was like a great place to work. A, uh, a playground. Age. It was for a total playground. Yeah. I was pinching myself all the time. Like they're paying me to, to do this. <laughs> 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 it was amazing. It was so much fun. Um, and that's, so that's, you know, that's really defined my, entry my entry into um hospitality design um new york city living in new york in the you know the late 90s early early knots was a wild time too so yeah. um yeah and then uh if you could think of okay so then that was were, were you going to rockwell to do hospitality design or did you get to play in all those different silos that they have 
So I started out, uh, I was hired to do Mohegan Casino, the, the original Mohegan oh. Casino. And so within that, which is in an interesting project, because obviously there's the casino part of it, but then there's all of the dining venues and the entertainment venues. Mm. Um, so uh, really, I, it was, it was interesting. What was interesting about Rockwell Group and, um, and David Rockwell's passion for wanting to do different types of projects. You talk about silos, like in, in the Rockwell world, there was, there really were no silos. It was an approach. It was an approach to bringing um, our mindset and our um, sort of collaborative, uh, creative thought process to any type of project. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, one of my, one of my favorite projects probably is has nothing to do with casinos or hotels or restaurants or nightclubs. It was, um, it was a children's hospital and oh, yeah, that where was, was that? Uh, so this was the children's hospital at Montefiore in the Bronx. Oh, okay. Yep. I see signs and for that when I'm driving into the city do, all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. what did you love the most about that? Like, why was that your favorite? Well, it was, I mean, for for so many reasons. I mean, obviously, I think the 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 client was a, was was for children, um, and for you know children who were you know in 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 struggling in different difficult times in their lives, and this is to provide a an interesting and hospitable and safe haven for them um, to to ex to recover, hopefully, uh, or at least to explore um, you know explore a route to recovery. So. Mm -hmm. The, the interesting thing about that project, um, and it was a long road in, in getting there, but it was a, uh, it was a collaboration really between the, the hospital, Montefiore, and, um, and Carl Sa they were, and Carl Sagan, uh, Dr. Ooh. Sagan. Yeah. So, uh, Carl Sagan before he had passed away. You're intriguing my geekiness. <laughs> yes, yes. Go. Into your okay, sci-fi coming back I, full circle into your sci-fi. He's, he's amazing. We could all yeah. learn from him. Oh, yes. So he um, he uh, before he passed away was was part of the um, Children's Health Fund. I think he was very involved in the Children's Health Fund and so had partnered um, with the Montefiore, with the hospital uh, to come up with this idea of, um, you know, approaching health care for children in a different in a different way so that mm -hmm. they are not scared um, in a sense of what they're going through. Uh, so um the uh the hospital when they decided to build a dedicated children's facility uh decided to do it as basically a living memorial to Dr. Sagan and his philosophies and they um they approached Rockwell because um they wanted somebody who can bring a perspective of hospitality to healthcare um, and to the children. So, and using Carl Sagan's philosophies of, you know, we are all star stuff. We all come from the yes. stars. We are, you we're know, all stardust. We are we all are. stardust. Um, so, you know, no matter what you're going through, you're not alone. Mm. Uh, you know, through the history of, you know, human history, we're all connected through DNA. And all of these stories are told throughout every level of that hospital. Um, and, uh, children are, uh, you know, it's really the overarching uh, design, let's say the design principle, the design vision was that children are um, are on a journey to just, yeah, how does it go? Um, children on a journey to healing. Wow. And so that is, um, I think that was a beautiful message. And to top it all off, <laughs> this project opened uh, October 2001, um, a month after the September 11th attacks. So oh. the opening of this facility, the connection to um, just the the sort of the sacredness of our humanity and caring for our children and 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 their future, it was just. Oh man, I'm I mean, getting I'll, goosebumps I'll take that with right me now. forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I literally I have goosebumps up and down my arm. That's uh, <laughs> and such a healing and in New yeah. York City yeah. at a time of real need. Um, wow, it's it. Thanks for sharing that. I'm uh, I'm actually surprised that um, I hear like this Montefiore story. Or I was talking to um Lionel from I Crave. I didn't realize that he had done um the Sloan Kettering, the new Sloan mm, Kettering. Mm, mm, and I had a mm -hmm, friend who was there mm -hmm. getting treatments and was like looking forward to getting chemo. And I was like, what? 
I worked on a Sloan Kettering project too. Yeah, oh, really? I did the uh, the outpatient facility out in Comac. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, I was like, I was like, how can you look forward to getting chemo? It's like, oh, it's amazing! It's like you can do this and learn, and there's all the. And then I wound up uh, talking to Lionel about it, not knowing that he was the designer. My point is, is that I don't know why, and this is probably a whole other podcast, but why there's only a couple of data points around the country of where these ideas of hospitality design have transitioned into healthcare. Mm -hmm. And when you think about healing, I think that hospitality and wellness and all those things that we do really well there, I don't know why it's not like a filter that every single hospital is crammed through from like a brand. It, I think it would just, healthcare and hospitals are supposed to be about healing and it just surprises me. So yeah, th I, providing thank, comfort and joy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and healing, but thank yeah. you for, for sharing that. And maybe I have to, I have to write that down because that's a whole other thing that we could talk about. <laughs> um, okay. So that on your journey, that being at Rockwell and being like in this playground, I've also loved the work he's done with kids because it's all about play, right? Mm -hmm. He did all these playgrounds like down by the um, mm -hmm. South, Se South Street Seaport with all those big blocks. And you could just really roll up your sleeves as a kid. I remember taking my kids there and they would just like, well, hit each other with the blocks, but they were having fun <laughs> at the same time. Um, but, okay, so that's your early career. Then, you know, you're, you have this hospitality design bug. And what I, we, you mentioned W before mm. as part of that. So I just wanted to share, like, on my journey, I was living in San Francisco when, when the W hotels first started opening in New York. And then I remember... The San Francisco one opened, the one in LA opened, and there were just these great parties. And I went to these opening parties. I don't even think I was in the industry yet, but it was so much fun and so exciting and such like a, and I think an important time in our industry. Mm -hmm. And now um, Marriott just bought the actually, and they don't, Marriott doesn't own very many assets, if I'm correct, but they just bought the W Union, Union Square, Square. Yeah. Um, to kind of use this as a laboratory to refine which way or what what the North Star for W is. And I, I'm really excited. I'm actually with Berman Falk. We're doing a lot of work in there as well. So oh, great. just a yeah. little little plug there. But there working go. with we're, yeah, working with Rockwell. Um and just tell us about your experience now of okay, your whole journey. Now you're working with the with the W brand and like where's that where's that going? And like what's your what, as a brand and all the things that we were talking about, the importance of brands before, like Tell me your thoughts on that. Tell us your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, so again, that's sort of a, a full circle for me. Um, I like to say I was in the room when W was born. <laughs> and I did. I worked on the, I was on the ideation team when we were concepting the first W on Lexington Avenue. Uh, I did the, uh, I did the design for the, um, at the Union Square one, actually, the, there was a bar in the basement. It's called Underbar at the time. It was oh, like this dark. And <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, I lived, I was living that whole, you know, late, like I said, late 90s, early 2000s, W life. Um, and, and now, uh, you know, these many years later, uh, W is, um, you know, has been tasked, our brand team has been tasked with saying, okay, well, where's, where's W go? Where will W go for the future? We, you know, let's evolve the brand. Let's, let the brand maybe grow up a little bit without losing its um, its origin story, which mm. was, is critical to I, to the definition of the brand. Right, that is yeah. W. W can't lose its essence. Um, but how do you? That's that's always the crazy challenge, right? How do you keep a brand relevant? How do you allow it to evolve while staying true to its essence? Um, and that that is what's I think what's really exciting for me right now. I'm, I've been working on. Um, uh, renovations for uh, some of our, you know, big properties, the Union Square one, there's a, another team working on that. And like you said, that's sort of Marriott um, owned, managed, and they're definitely putting, you know, their money where their mouth is. Uh, but with um, partnering with some of our other owners, we are also doing um, full repositioning and renovation of the W Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So that will be a sort of an East Coast, West Coast um, proof of concept for where W is going. Uh, 
And, um, you know, and we have a bunch of new openings uh, globally that are also happening to sort of spearhead this um, this forward momentum for the brand. Um, we just had Rome open and Budapest and um, we've got coming, in, you know, on the boards in Naples. So there's lots there's lots happening um, for W. It's a super exciting time. Um, I think the the interesting challenge of having known known it in its you know, from its origin story to to now and, and having that perspective uh, and being able to push it forward. Um, the brand team is, and our strategies team who, you know, we work very closely with, we have lots of layers in Marriott, um, but the, uh, the, the, the promise of the brand now is to, uh, what do they say? They say, um, ignite, ignite curiosity, and expand worlds. That is mm. that is W's new um, north star, uh, and the the promise is um, is fulfilled through uh, defining this new uh, new white space of luxuries, and we call this luxury liberated. Mm. So, uh, how do you define luxury liberated? That is the um, that is the the gold ticket question, um, and and that is what we are working on. Uh, it's shifted from what you were talking about, like this nightclub party scene, right? That had so much energy. Uh, so we call it, we used to call that the uh, a cocktail culture, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now um, W is evolving into more of a um, a cultural cocktail. You could oh, say. Oh, I like that. Okay. Uh, so it's really about a mix of culture. Uh, our guests, who used to be known as the uh, disruptors, are um, are now identified as the connectors. So they are taking, um, you know, it's really diving into the into the mindset of guests who um, are intrigued by paradox like you know mm. unexpected collisions different perspectives uh pulling you know pulling world experiences together so that also is very true to new york and the energy of new york from the 90s when the brand started that sort of very forward thinking positive energy is still the heart of of w today and and that's where we're taking it so it's it's much more sophisticated it's definitely more luxury um than than it was in the past maybe you know it's it's not as um i'll say it's not as sort of designed for design's sake it's not as mm -hmm. gratuitous it's much more um intentional meaningful um guest experiences and materiality uh, not so much that plastic and bling, um, you know, so that's where it's evolving uh, and it's really beautiful. And I'm so excited to, for everybody to, to see where it's going. Um, yeah. It's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely pushing the envelope of luxury in a, in a different direction. Well, and also going back to the early ones, that idea of cocktail culture, like, mm -hmm. Since then, all of our livers have hardened, right? So, <laughs> so we got to, but as you're saying, it's uh, to ignite curiosity and expand worlds. Mm -hmm. And I, you really lit up as you were saying that. And to me, it was the same kind of lighting up that I saw as you were talking about, like Carl Sagan and being yeah. stardust, right? It's the yeah. same. And I love that idea of collisions and connection because that's where everything happens. That's where like from kinetic energy, you collide with something and you have a new trajectory. Exactly. It could be an experience. It's a conversation like we're having. Um, yeah, that's it's really exciting, and and it's it's a great brand promise to ignite curiosity and expand worlds. Mm -hmm. oh. And I I just remember, even though it's different than the original W, what I I think what I if if just from my experience, I was back in the day, like after the first ones were opening, I was working with Steve Higgins. Do you remember him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he God rest his soul. Um, but he, uh, I remember Teresa Fatino, who was working for W, so doing the design, she like concepting it. I remember one time she like she came into the office and I was buying stuff and make and making things happen, executing the design. And I she dropped like a bunch of shirt fabrics, like striped shirt fabrics, like thump on my desk. Okay, we these need to be bedspreads. And I'm like, what? How do I do <laughs> that? But it was just the idea of like she had a totally different perspective on 
mm-hmm. it should be. And no, this is what it needs to be. Like figure out a way to get there. Yeah. And then I would have to work with all these different vendors and try and find like, how do I make this thing, a striped shirt, like last and be durable, but also look cool and be comfortable. And yeah. it was really interesting, interesting challenges. And I think in any time you're starting something new or, or reigniting something, um, you really have to look at things from a completely different perspective. Yeah. I mean, there, it takes a lot of, you know, courage <laughs> yeah. to try and break out of the old mold. Um, but that's, you know, that's all part of W2. It's, uh, it's definitely a bold and, uh, and um, statement making uh, brand. And, uh, you know, ultimately it's the concept of, uh, of the living room, right. Came out of, out of W. Um, nice. lobby is still called the living room and, and that's where everybody wants to hang out, right? That's, that's where the, that tribe, that tribe, that community comes together. Right. Mm. So. And that, and from an operational perspective, that idea of the whatever, whenever mm-hmm. line, like that was, still. That, was, that was, and it's still there, but that was like so different. Like it, it was just like, and it, it was exciting. It's New York, right? I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's true in the city and you get whatever, whenever. And that's the I, promise that this brand was trying to share with the world. Oh, I love it. Uh, a walk down memory lane. So <laughs> even in the meatpacking district. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where they actually packed meat. I think there might be one bit, one butcher still there, right? <laughs> is it La Frida? I don't know. I don't remember. Or might, is it know. just a storefront for them? I don't even know. But it's, it's so, <laughs> I was just there yesterday. And I'm just like, oh my God, this place is just so different. Um, okay. So career journey, kind of what you're working on now and, and importance of brands and, and reinvigorating W kind of as we're talking right now and you're thinking about the future, what's exciting you most? Well, uh, I mean, it's definitely W. It's That's the biggest challenge on my plate right now um, is getting it right. Uh, and um, it's, you know, it's, you have to be willing to make some mistakes along the way uh, because that's how you experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, it's that sort of fearlessness of just going out there and trying to define something, uh, redefine something. Um, I guess the other, the other challenge really is, um, you know, is for our team as a whole uh, and for global design, um, Marriott global design. I think, you know, we, uh, we have so many different brands, as you said in the beginning of our conversation, and you know, it's we are um, tasked with sort of being the stewards of those brands, and and you know, when we partner with uh, our owner franchisees and um, and their design uh, clients, there are you know, we sort of see this as a you know triangular partnership. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we are you know we want the the project, the property to be on brand, on strategy, but we also want it to be successful for the owner um, in, in renovations or new builds. These are things that we are constantly, uh, you know, addressing every day, uh, trying to make sure that these projects happen on time, on budget, on strategy. Those are our three, <laughs> our three big things. But, you know, really, we also want to put our, you know, put our money where our mouth is when we're saying, you know, we we see so much come across our plate and we've done as collectively as a group, we have so much experience in the design industry, um, you know, tap into us, tap into our expertise, uh, use use global design US and Canada as your extension of your team, um, mm. because we really want to see the success of these projects. We're so passionate and excited about design um and about hospitality and delivering that to the guest so i think that's you know that's our biggest challenge every day yes i agree but that's why we keep getting up every day Mm -hmm. to solve these challenges (laughs) to solve these challenges um so going back to this idea of igniting curiosity expanding worlds and having collisions and connections um okay so that's that's the brand promise right and then Mm -hmm. If we go back to the beginning of our conversation where, um, you know, hospitality is really about connections and making people feel comfortable and having positive 
human shared as human experiences. Um, what's something either currently or in the future when you think about the W brand that kind of best exemplifies that? And it may it may be the living room, but uh, mm-hmm. like is is there something? Um, like if you were to like walk us through verbally about what what that could, what that looks like or what what you're excited about and how how that all how that becomes a reality. Hmm. Um, or it might be all under NDA and you can't say anything. No, it's it's you know <laughs> I could do a, I could do a whole uh, W brand uh, strategy immersion for you here, but that would be another hour <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Um, so we, you know, we have a strategy, right? There's, and that's what we ask designers to do when they're coming, um, to the table of, you know, looking through the lens of this brand, looking, you know, trying to find those paradoxes or those collisions. We give them a little bit of a toolkit to use in order to do that, but right. Everyone is different and unique. So, um, we call it the mix, uh, and we have these sort of three tenants, uh, within that, um, within the mix, of um you know creating let me see i have it actually right here oh <laughs> fancy that fancy that i happen to have it right here so we call these three tenants um form follows fantastic mm-hmm. tactile materiality and clean maximalism mm. and uh these are this is what the designer needs to interpret to create the or at least draws the parallel of igniting curiosity and and expanding worlds, right? So can you say those three things again? Yeah, sure. Form follows fantastic. Mm, okay. So that sort of celebrating uh monumental and and intimate scales, right? So playing with scale has always been something I think that is um uh, is intriguing. Uh we mm. see uh Philippe Stark does that really well, yes. right? Um, so that's something that we want to explore. Uh, tactile materiality is the third one. And that's um, that's where you're using material and using color as, uh, as a architectural, like you can actually use color as an architectural feature, um, mm. as a material. So... Nobody does color like W does color, right? So it's um, not necessarily the primary colors, right? Like we're looking for those in-between colors, those unexpected pairings of color and of materials. So when I said earlier, it's not so much about the, you know, the high shine lacquer plastic uh, sparkly look anymore, which, you know, that was very 90s. So it's, that was cool back then. Maybe it'll come around again. Who knows? It always does. Uh, but now, you know, we want that that richness of texture and the authenticity of materials, but used in unique ways. Um, so that's sort of putting it on its head a little bit, uh, ways unexpected. Um, mm. And then clean maximalism. Uh, you know, that is also a very sort of W way of looking at um, at setting the stage of the space, mm. right? We have this mm. idea of conceal and reveal. Uh, not everything is shown all at once. You have an opportunity to explore, uh, use uh, transitional spaces um, for experiences of getting from one place to another, not just, you know, wayfinding. Uh, so there's the, we give we give the designers some tools for sort of looking at things differently. Um, but it's really up to them. Uh, that challenge is, you know, again, don't be don't be safe, be fearless. Yeah. That's uh that's definitely a brand um personality. <laughs> oh wow. I uh, th- so thank you for sharing all that and um thank you for repeating them because I just really wanted to get my head into into what it all means and and again that and that's what's so amazing and what I love about you know, like what we all do me me on just a small part of furniture you mm-hmm. a bigger from a brand perspective and all the parts in between it's really it's always executing a vision that's in alignment with something right and you you just mm. you know when it's all done well and we know what those exciting projects are where like everyone is happy and everyone is raving and um i don't know that's kind of what gets me out of bed right it's uh yeah it's helping it's and, and just in my small part it's you know i say it's shortening people's journeys but it's like i don't want people to burn so many calories to have to 
execute their vision on one little small part of this whole thing. I want to be able to like empathize with them, see what they're, what they're thinking, how they're doing it, see what's most important to them and translate that into a three-dimensional object, mm. That, mm. like a chair, which we will mm -hmm. always need chairs we and we will always need, need cabinets and we will always need beds. And mm -hmm. so like, I don't see, uh, well, this could be hubris. Uh, hopefully AI won't take away furniture. <laughs> but I, I feel like I feel like people will always need to sit down and sleep. So at least we will always and have, have a chairs. conversation in person yes. with each other. <laughs> yes, and and to collide with each other. So hopefully mm -hmm. we don't get plugged into some matrix like metaverse unless we're already oh in it. When some sometimes yeah. <laughs> I feel like we are. <laughs> like you are a sci-fi geek, right? <laughs> I know. I was reading. I was reading some article articles about current events, which we don't have to get into because that's a whole other subject. But um. There's all these people going down to Atlanta and uh, or and getting their mug shots right now and uh. right whatever it is what it is but in the <laughs> comment section someone wrote wow this is turning into a really cool simulation right yeah <laughs> it's uh interesting yeah we're uh, we're living in a in a in a sim so mm. so sometimes I feel like we are mm. um, okay last question for you. Um, Going back to when you were in college as an English lit major, and again, mm -hmm. I really find like writing and analyzing other works and making interpretations of them. To me, it's really design. Like I, I know we talked about that, but it's like, it's about having an idea and expanding upon it. But so in a way, even though you're a designer now, I would I push back and say you were always designing. And anyone who's a writer or creating things is is ultimately designing things. But if you were to the Linda I'm talking to now were to teleport back to the English lit major, mm. Linda, um, what advice do you have for yourself? That's such a good question. Uh, advice to my younger self back in college. Um, don't have that fourth shot of tequila, first off. <laughs> <laughs> right, because we're, it, it's not a cocktail. It's not a cocktail not, culture not anymore. It's not a cocktail culture anymore. We're now liberating uh, luxury. <laughs> Um, no, I would, I would say, uh, that, you know, the, the skills that I developed in, uh, research, um, researching for my writing, uh, in organizing, you know, organizing my thoughts, uh, and in then efficiently communicating those thoughts, uh, was really the basis for everything in my professional life, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to communicate clearly to, um, to anyone is, is, a, is an incredible skill to have, uh, either in the written form or the, the spoken uh, word. So I think that's where, you know, theater becomes the that essence, right? The written word turning into the spoken word, turning into an experience held by a collective uh, group. Um, taking theater then and putting it into uh, a physical space is a is a direct, you know, link, a direct connection to all of that. Um, having worked at Rockwell Group, and you know, we know that you know the passion for theater and theatrical design and experience. Um, there, I think, was sort of the culmination of that path forward. Um, and uh, yeah, and that that has evolved sort of into where we are today with this, um, you know, sort of appreciation of of lifestyle, of different lifestyles, of sharing those different lifestyles with each other. Uh, and yeah, that's I think it's all been a. A pretty in in retrospect, a clear path, but maybe not such a clear path while it was happening. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's it was it's been a really fun journey. Hopefully, continuing that journey. <laughs> Who knows where it will go? I yeah, I know you will continue it. And then you know what? Whether we're in a sim or not, uh, we will all be stardust again. And I love That's that. Right. And we all come from it. And and like the stars, like whatever we can all be doing to keep promoting these collisions of things mm. like stardust makes really cool stuff like people like you and um 
this has been awesome. So if people wanted to learn more about you or connect with you in some way or learn more about what you're up to at Marriott, um, what are some good ways that um, they can connect with you? Yeah, sure. I am, uh, well, I am on LinkedIn, of course, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Instagram. So I don't have a very right. interesting uh, post on Instagram, but I do like to post things every once in a while. So, you know, Great. if you want to get into my head, there you go. And then we'll put the link to uh, Marriott as well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, if you guys, well, all, all the, everyone's always looking for people. So uh, I'll just mm, say like, yes, we are. Yes, yeah. We so are. good, good people connect. Uh, good, people. Eh, good people collide. There we go. That's right. <laughs> Passion, passionate collisions. Yes. And what else? Okay. So great. And we'll put all that in the show notes. So again, I just want to give you a heartfelt thank you. I'm, this has been a really fabulous conversation and I'm so glad I got to like think about being stardust and becoming yeah. a person and like all the cool things that we've created. Um, but thank you, Linda, sure, this has been fantastic. You. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Hug, virtual hug. Virtual hug. <laughs> uh, well, we'll give each other a real hug in person soon. I know we will. Um, and then I just also, again, at the beginning, Linda mentioned it's, we just passed our two year mark and we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for all of you amazing listeners. And I know that uh, just from the feedback that I get all over the place, uh, not so much about me, but about how, what they learn from our guests, um, it just keeps me going. So um, again, I think it's just another way of colliding. And if so, if this helped you kind of ignite your curiosity and expand your world how's that for looping the brand promise in there um please pass it along because again it's mostly all word of mouth i mean we post some things on some social media but really it's oh my god so and so sent me this and i loved it and thank you and blah 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 so it's all word of mouth so please if this changed your idea of hospitality or how to make a hospitality happen in the built environment please pass it along and we'll see you next time thank you awesome. thank you